All right, great. I'm actually going to go ahead and get started instead of waiting just because um, we do have a lot that we want to cover today and we only have about an hour, I believe. So, um, so I'm Jamie Deckard. I'm one of the Loink uh, terminology developers and I've been with Loink for almost 10 years now. And I'm very excited to be able to prevent, present with Pam Banning, our co-chair for the lab Loink committee. So um, I'm super excited about that. I'm going to first, um, uh, actually, I was going to advance here. So to skip, I, I briefly just wanted to show the disclosures for the two 2020 Loink funding sources. Um, but I'm going to cover the purpose and scope and then go over the Loink concept model, talk about additional term attributes that we have uh, linked to our terms and discuss resources available for implementing the link. And then Pam's going to talk about jumpstarting your project. Um, and then we'll definitely try to leave time for a Q&A. So standards uh, make health data, as we probably all know, more portable and understandable to different computer systems. And they're essentially divided into two main categories. There's the syntax standards, um, and then the semantic standards. And LOINC falls within the semantic standards. The syntax standards are um, the structured way to send messages or documents um, or APIs. And examples of those include HL7, V2, CCDA, and FHIR. Um, and then these are also kind of called technical standards. Um, but to understand the content or the meaning of what's being sent within those standards, we also have semantic standards like LOINC, SNOMED, ARCSNORM, and so on. So here's just an example of a systolic blood pressure from three different hospitals where they all have a different code, the red there that you see. They have um, a different name for how they define that observation that's done on a patient, and then it's a, a different hospital for each of these. And the goal is for all of this information to be the same. So the same code, the same description, and then the same coding system. Um, just of note, within the same structured message and within a lot of the um, syntax standards, you, there is a way to also send the local code information. So you don't lose that information. You can send that along with the standardized code. So just a brief history of LOINC. Um, as many of you know, it was organized by Dr. Clem McDonald. Um, in 1994, and he saw that need for universal standard language for observation identifiers. And they first began working on the laboratory observations, and then just a couple years after that, they moved to clinical observations as well. Um, so it now includes both laboratory and clinical order and result concepts um, for health measurements, observations, and documents. So the development of LOINC, it's maintained by the team at Regan Streif Institute in Indiana. Um, we have the three committees that Swapna had mentioned earlier, the three main committees, um, the laboratory, clinical, and then the LOINC um, Radlex committee. And then underneath the clinical committee, we have the nursing and document ontology subcommittees that meet frequently. We also have a vibrant international community with active uh, participation or the, who actively participate in all the LOINC development activities. So around the world, LOINC, even though it began in the US, it's now used in over 170 countries. Um, it's the official national standard in over 30 of those countries. And um, just through international adoption um, has enabled, uh, or it is enabled through the LOINC translations. So currently we have over 20 different variants um, from 12 languages. The scope of LOINC, it's the standard terminology to identify a lab test, a clinical measurement, documents, surveys, um, and other observations that are done on a patient. Um, so the idea is there's one common identifier for a result where it's clinically the same. Um, just like I showed in that systolic blood pressure example, uh, we have over 90,000 terms currently, um, and they're categorized into three major types, including lab, clinical. We have a HIPAA attachments category, which is focused on payer provider information exchange, and then as well as standardized survey instruments. So this is just a wordle to show the different laboratory link um, uh, domains that we have or specialties. 
And you can see microbiology and chemistry and tox are the biggest areas where we have the most LOINC codes. And then in clinical LOINC, um, we have a wide range of, um, for OB ultrasound, radiology, uh, uh, EKGs, um, all the document codes. Um, we have quite a span of different radiology codes or different uh, clinical codes. And then for surveys and forms, uh, this area is also growing uh, significantly. We're um, representing all types of different clinical assessments. So we have codes for individual observations. So like a very specific single test result that is done on a patient or an observation such as body weight that is um, made on a patient and recorded. We also have codes for collections. So um, an order, for example, or a battery um, like a CBC with auto differential um, or a collection of codes for vital signs, the weight and height panel and so on. Um, the collections uh, like discharge summary also fall under this category because they're a collection of information about a patient related to their discharge summary or their history and physical or whatever it might be. So any clinical notes related to that fall under collections or document codes. All right, so now we're gonna dive into the LOINC concept model. So whenever we talk about a LOINC term, we're actually talking about the LOINC code as well as the name. So the whole thing, the code plus the name, um, and there's different names that can be used, but those things represent a LOINC term. And it's the observation or measurement that is done on a patient. So the LOINC code itself is a unique permanent numeric code. Um, it serves as a computer possible, processable representation of a LOINC term. Um, there is no intrinsic structure except that the last character is a mod check, 10 check digit. And if you want to look into how that's calculated, you can refer to Appendix C in the LOINC user's guide in our knowledge base. Um, the, LOINC, the only thing you can determine um, about the LOINC code is when it was created. So the older codes are, have smaller numbers as the one shown below. The 1-8 was the very first LOINC code that was created a cycle of year. Um, and then the current codes are in the 90,000s. And once a code is officially released, it is never removed from the LOINC distribution. It will always be included. The LOINC name um, is a human readable text rendering or version um, for that code. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, we have several different LOINC names. The three that are listed here are the most commonly used, I would say, right now. Um, we also have, for example, consumer names, things like that, and provider names. Um, but the fully specified name, which we'll talk about in a second, is the one that we would recommend for any mapping that's being done. The long common name is just a, is our primary display name, and it's um, mainly a user-friendly readable name. And then the short name um, historically was for systems that had character limits and we keep our short name under 40 characters currently. Here's just a quick example for, with the SARS coronavirus, um, where there's this is antibody testing um, for the fully specified name. Um, we're gonna go over the details of each of these pieces, but the fully specified name is essentially each axis of a LOINC term um, separated by a colon, and that becomes the fully specified name. The long common name is a generated name um, that we create based on those axes. And then the short name also is a generated name based on those axes. Okay, for the fully specified name, the first part, um, it, it's uh, six axes, as I mentioned. And the first part is the component or analyte. We use those interchangeably because in lab, you're often talking about an analyte. Uh, but in clinic, the clinical space, analyte doesn't make as much sense when you're talking about body weight or something like that. Um, so component is what we most commonly refer to that um, axis as. And that is the entity or thing that's being measured. And then the second axis is the property, um, and the, which is the dimension of that analyte. And we're going to go over each of these in detail. 
Um, and then we have the time, the timing aspect for the measurement, the system, or you know, the specimen or setting, body region. Um, there's the scale that kind of is a general representation of the result type. Um, and then the method. And the method is the only axis that uh, does not have to be populated for every term. Um, it is an optional one. But in some cases, it's really needed, especially in certain domains, um, because results are significantly different depending on the method that's used. So for the component, again, it's the substance or entity that is measured, evaluated, or observed. And here's just some examples like glucose, um, breaths taken, uh, fluid intake, uh, walking speed, heartbeats. You can see we have just um, these examples just um, show the difference or across lab and clinical and the different types of uh, components or entities that are there that would be measured. And we have, oh, thousands and thousands of components in Moink, as you can imagine. So the component is actually divided into three main subparts. So the first part um, is that analyte or component. Um, and then the second part after the first carrot or hat is the challenge. And then we have the adjustments um, after that. So for the component, or the core, the beginning, that could also include like a divisor. Um, so the example they are given is the oxyhemoglobin over hemoglobin dot total. So it can represent a fraction, um, but the challenge then represents whether it's after a meal it was taken, the measurement was taken, or um, one minute post birth, or for weight, like if clothes were on or if they weren't on. These are all what we would consider a challenge um, for the measurement. And then the adjustment. So uh, if there, it might be an adjustment to the patient's actual body temperature or corrected for heart rate. Uh, those are just some examples of how that the original value um, might be adjusted for different reasons. So all of these are packed into the component, which makes it our most complex axes, actually. Uh, the property then, which is the second axis, um, represents the characteristic or attribute of the component. Um, so when you're reporting something, oftentimes if you look at the results and what the results are, those will tell you the type of property. So if the easiest one is like a quantitative measurement with units, when you have units there, like grams, or the example there, grams over hour, um, which shows a mass rate. So the units along with um, the types of results that are reported will help define that property. Uh, the type is uh, where you have a, a definitive list or of items that you can select from. PRID is the presence of something and then the identity of it. So if it's there, it'll be reported. If it's not there, it'd be negative. Um, the time is the duration of time. So um, age would have a property of time so if you're 24 years old, um, the property for that term to report that value would be time. Uh, and then color and appearance, you can just see all these different types of properties that can be used with the LOINC term. So one caution is this is the most difficult axes for mapping. Um, it's really helpful to try to understand uh, what that property means of the different properties that are in LOINC currently. And we don't frequently create new properties. It's not that common, but we have over time in order to better define terms. Um, and so, and then for all quantitative measurements, you must choose a LOINC with a property that reflects those reported units. It's very key. And then I just listed there some of the top 10 properties currently uh, in lab that are used by LOINC codes. The timing is our third axis. Um, so again, this represents the interval of time over which an observation or measurement was made. So point in time is our most common. Almost all questions that are asked or um, measurements that are taken, like a drawn specimen, are done at random. You know, and so it's done at a point in time, or it's a single blood draw, something like that. 
those are all point in time. But we also have like the 24 hour. Um, here's the example of a 24 hour shift, but you can also say for a 20 hour urine, 24 hour urine specimen um, are also common. And then there's other examples there of different, uh, for the study, the minimum over the period of a study or the mean over a 10 hour time period. Um, what is the maximum over an eight hour time? Um, all of these, those types of things are more common in clinical, uh, like with survey instruments or clinical assessments. Lab, you most commonly see point in time or 24 hour types of timings. Our system is the, let's see, we're on the fourth axis. <laughs> and this represents the specimen or the setting for like clinical concepts um, or clinical notes, things like that. It would be the setting or a body part um, for which the observation was made. So in the lab space more so, or clinical, I guess, with um, ultrasound, things like that, you could have the yolk sac from a fetus. Um, an upper GI tract. Uh, you could be talking about a ventilator. So the result that is messaged or sent is, real, is specific about the ventilator. It's not about a patient um, or any kind of specimen or anything like that. And so in that case, the system would be ventilator. Um, if the ultrasound measurement was for a bladder, um, it would represent, then the system would be bladder, uh, blood from a donor, um, and then emergency department would be like the setting. So if you have an outpatient um, or an emergency department consult note, for instance, um, if that consult note happened in the emergency department, then that would be the, the system or the setting in the LOINC code. So the second part of the system is the hat carrot as represented by the examples in fetus and donor. So these are all, um, this is used to indicate if the source is not the patient. So in all other cases, like the bladder or the eye dot, la the left eye, um, outpatient even, ventilator, all of those, um, not ventilator as far as patient, but all of the bladder, eye, and so on, those, the assumption is that you're talking about the patient. And only when we need to distinguish results um, that are not the patient, then we use that hat, the super system. Um, and this is needed when results from the donor, for instance, or from the fetus are gonna be stored in the patient record. So it's not the donor's record, it's gonna be stored into the patient's record. The scale um, is the type of data reported for the substance or entity. So whether it's quantitative, um, or ordinal where the answers can be ranked. So one plus, two plus, three plus are ordinal, mild, mild moderate, severe, um, and none few are rare few and so on. Um, positive, negative also fall under ordinal as well as detected, not detected. Because in those cases, um, it's binary, um, but you can add, you can see how many labs would add that intermediate like, um, positive, uh, um, I'm trying to think about the, <laughs> I just lost, I just lost the train of thought there, but uh, yeah, positive, intermediate, negative, you know, like those things where you can get then a ranking um, and it, it moves from a binary to more of a ranked result. Um, but all of those fall under ordinal. Um, nominal is for a, a list or short text result that um, might rep be reported. So it's not a big narrative string, but it might be a brief result um, that could represent or even be turned into um, a list of codable results, for instance. And then there's some examples there. Uh, narrative is where it is a paragraph of text uh, that cannot be enumerated. And then doc um, represents a collection of information and doc are codes that that are, have a scale of doc um, don't don't mean that it's a document per se. Um, it's just it's really meant to represent that collection of information. It could be in the form of a PDF that it's resulted. It could be in an XML. It could be narrative. The collection of information could be narrative with some structure or very little structure. 
Um, but the main purpose of it is that it is a collection of information. The just of note for surveys and panels, the scale is often a dash. So because all of the child elements contained within those panels uh, vary as far as what their property and scale are. So they're often dashes for that reason. And then the last axis, the six axes, is the method. Um, and this is the procedure used to make the measurement or observation. Um, in the clinical space, we have measured, estimated, observed. Um, in laboratory and clinical, there's calculated. Uh, ultrasound we have for method. Um, EKGs. Um, in molecular pathology, we have probe AMPTAR, which represents nucleic acid amplification um, with a target and then probe detection. Uh, and we also have terms for the non-probe where it's, it's not a probe-based detection like milk curve analysis. Uh, and then some others, manual and automated, um, especially with cell markers. And so the method again is the only one uh, that is all optional and it is only included when it's important to make that distinction. So I have just a couple examples of trying to put it all together um, and then the slight differences that you see between terms. Those differences are underlined um, in these examples. And the first row uh, shows each axis value. And then in the gray there, it shows the LOINC uh, code and then the long common name for that code. So it shows you the readable format. So again, the fully specified name, which we would use for mapping or recommend for mapping to your local tests, would be that uh, showing all the six axes for that term separated by the colon. So sodium, SCNC is substance concentration, the time aspect is a point in time, and then the system is urine, scale is quantitative, and in the second example, it's the same thing, except the system is uh, CSF. And then for body weight, we have the difference is the system again, the patient versus the fetus, and then ultrasound um, estimated um, from abdominal circumference. And then these examples show the heart rate and then the, uh, also the SARS coronavirus 2 example. So for heart rate, the system XXX just means it's unspecified, um, meaning it could be from the peripheral artery or um, arterial measurement, whatever it might be. Um, so that's your most basic generic heart rate code uh, there. And then there's also where some systems want to differentiate between any heart rate generated anyway or those um, determined by palpitation. And so that would be the second code there. And then for SARS coronavirus, you see the components are slightly different where one's uh, the measurement of an antibody, and then the second one is the measurement of the RNA. Also, they're different specimens, so antibodies measured in serum or plasma, and then by immunoassay for the method. And then for the RNA, it's in a respiratory specimen um, with uh, typically PCR, um, but nucleic acid amplification with probe detection. So other attributes of a LOINC term, um, the six axes define the given term, but we have many other attributes to help users understand the meaning, how to organize terms, provide metadata about the terms, and to provide um, information around the use of the term, such as copyright. Here's just uh, some examples of um, a different additional attributes that we have about a term. So these, these are just meant to help guide and or help with mapping and help guide the use of the term. Um, but the other, the six axes that we talked about are the most important um, attributes for a term. So we have units um, and formula um, that may be provided if the method is calculated. The, uh, type of term, whether it's a laboratory, clinical, or survey. Um, the type name, so that defines the type. The type is uh, the one, two, three, or four, so it's the number. And then the type name shows the name of the classification. And then the class is kind of the subtype, 
within each of these. So examples are microbiology, chemistry, are subtypes of laboratory, but we define those as a class or they, others think of them as like the category. Um, the status of a term, whether it's active, deprecated, and so on. The order OBS, whether it's an order only, so panel codes, batteries, things like that would be order only, um, whereas certain test results would never be ordered by themselves, so they would be observation only. And then some are both, where they could be ordered and observed. We have lots of related names that help with searching. We have answer lists for um, codes that have, you know, a specific or defined answer list, uh, like for qualitative and nominal codes. Uh, the answer list type indicates the binding of that answer list, whether it's just an example, which in the lab space, almost all are just examples. Uh, for the survey space, we have the survey question text that from the original instrument, the external copyright link. Um, for all of our codes, we have the version last changed, um, as well as the version first released. We have the change type, whether it was, um, and each of these are defined in our user's guide. And then we have descriptions for part and term level. All of this and all these attributes you can view on a details page for each term. And I, this is hard to read, I know, but it, it essentially is just showing you that a lot of information is on our detail page. We also have relationships to other terminologies. Um, LOINX has links to um, external ter terminologies at multiple levels. So at the terms, as well as the pieces, the parts, and the answer strings. And there's some examples there. Um, these links were created either as a primary link effort or as part of a collaboration with other organizations. And the relationships are included in various formats in the public link releases. So what's not part of the link code is the instrument used in the testing, details about the specimen or site where it was collected. So right arm is not included, things like that. Uh, the priority of the testing, and who verified the result, um, the size of the, of the amount of the sample collected, and so on. We try to only make names and codes for things that are real concepts. So we don't try to make all possible permutations, but they're real, the codes are based on real results that are being reported. Um, we make both post-coordinated um, as well as pre-coordinated types of codes. So if somebody reports the method elsewhere, for instance, and it's not a key part of the clinical result, um, they may use a methodless code, for instance, and then use another code for reporting the, the uh, method. We also have the same with the system. Um, depending on the use case, they may uh, map to a general link code that doesn't specify the system, and then they use another link code or the structured message to send the information about the system. So there's different ways of reporting uh, results, and we support those different ways. Um, and then we try to avoid creating codes for concepts that can re be represented in the syntax model, in the structured model, like HL7. There's lots of resources that are available for implementing LOINC. Um, I'm just showing the download page here where you can get the full link table, um, as well as a mapping tool, Realma, and then all of our accessory files. And just of note, we have a full link table that includes lots of different fields, as well as a core link table. And the idea is, is that that core link table is stable. It's not going to change. And I think it takes several cycles, several meetings of announcing that there will be a change if we do change it. So that's important for implementers mainly. Um, but we do have those two versions. And then we have lots of different accessory files um, to help you use LOINC, um, like the document ontology file for all the clinical notes, um, the groups file, the LOINC order codes for the common order codes. Um, you can just see all the different files that are available online, depending on your use case. And then tools for mapping local terms of LOINC. As Swapna mentioned in, our up, in her updates, we're going to be um, 
revamping our search.link and they're going to demo a little bit of that later on today. So we're hoping to add um, over time a lot of the functionality that you have in Realma to online um, and then gradually phase out the Realma tool. But the Realma tool is currently still available. We also have a link panel browser online um, where you can search different panels by domain. Uh, they're organized by categories. The lab categories are primarily based on that link class, so microbiology, chemistry, and so on. And then the non-lab ones are organized based on the top level category, uh, such as the clinical specialty or government agency. There's lots of additional free resources online. So we have that quick start guide that you can look at, tutorials, um, and so on. And the one I didn't mention here also is our new knowledge base that's online, where the user's guide is and the Realma guide and so on. So these are all very useful. And now, oh, also one last thing is just ways to stay connected. I highly recommend this because you keep up to date on new link releases, things like that. Um, some people like uh, going to the user's forum and Pam Banning is an active member, you know, there that helps respond to questions as well as other people. But uh, there's just different ways that you can connect uh, to the LOINC community um, as, in addition, you know, as well as participating in committee meetings or any work groups that we might be having. So I definitely encourage that, um, especially if it's in your area of interest. Okay, now I want to hand it over to Pam um, to talk about jumpstarting your project. Thanks, Jamie. And mm -hmm. you will hang on and um, stay on and advance the slides for me. Sure, we I can do that. Consolidated that oh, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Wow, <laughs> Jamie. That's you, you really breezed through that quite fast. I did. Um, and we have a packed room of like around 100 people. So oh, wow. it's really quite an honor um, to be introducing this or reintroducing this to um, a wide variety of people around the world. So thank you all for attending. Um, if you're a first time attendee to this conference, uh, welcome. Uh, I just encourage you to have an open mind. You never know when inspiration is going to hit you. Uh, just have a mind open like a sponge. This learning curve is steep, we admit it, but <laughs> this is a community and we're all here. We're all in this together. Um, so if we haven't met before, my name's Pam Banning. Uh, my background is as a medical laboratory technologist. Uh, I worked that for several decades before leaving the benches and going into the IT department and working as a database administrator for a laboratory information system. Um, so I was introduced to LOINC 25 years ago um, uh, while I was a database administrator at ARUP Laboratories in Salt Lake City. Um, these next few minutes, so uh, I've done this level of conversation anywhere from one hour to four hours. And I'm going to distill this down to 15 minutes <laughs> um, just to give you something that is tangible and accessible and that for all of the examples that you're seeing throughout this whole week, come back to this slide deck. And this is the place you start. This gives you something tangible to start with. And I'm hoping that we'll have an honest, open and transparent conversation here. Go ahead, Jamie. So I will disclose, I've been employed by 3M Health Information Services for a couple of decades now, either as a contractor or as an employee. I'm always grateful for the support that they give me throughout the years uh, in my uh, roles as a volunteer to the LOINC Lab Committee. I'm in the middle of a three-year cycle uh, as the co-chair for the Laboratory LOINC Committee. So those of you that are thinking about, maybe you'd like to do some more volunteer activity, there'll be an announcement in a couple of, in a year or so that uh, the co-chair is going to be open. Uh, next slide. Oh, so as I said before, while this may be new to you, this is not new to the community. The community has been here for 25 years. We have been trying to get the word out for education through both uh, tutorials and workshops, but also through documentation. So in that stay connected slide that Jamie had, um, reach out to the channels uh, on there if you're not finding what you need. Um, the user forum, we try to answer uh, within 24 hours. Um, so you can always post questions out there. Next slide. 
both Swapna and Jamie also mentioned the uh, guides that are being produced. Um, and there's one microbiology that's already published. And then currently there's a concurrent development on a link allergy guide and on a quick start mapping guide. Um, these are not the same guides that come as your download. If you download Realma, that there's a link user guide there that uh, is on your public C drive in your public folder. Um, these are downloadable by intent from the website. And as a community, we're working together for, to combine all of our knowledge for a variety of guides of the different laboratory domains. And um, as it was also mentioned earlier, we're looking for some pilot test sites. So if you have not started implementing or adopting LOINC yet, you might want to reach out to Reagan Streif and let them know that you'd be interested in having your site pilot because you might get some extra help, which is always a good thing. Uh, next slide. Out on the website uh, is recommended readings. There's a page for that. And again, going with the community has been publishing articles and documentation to help leave breadcrumbs for those that are following us in our footsteps. There's seven different mapping strategy articles from AMIA, Symposia, and journals that's out there on the website. And there's a section called Implementation Resources. Uh, of which one of those, the interoperability uh, project plan template, is something that I had put up at the beginning of meaningful use. So it was written primarily for a hospital setting or a medical laboratory setting. Um, but I'm going to expand upon it today to help include the IVD manufacturers and um, people from the clinical domains that are um, attending with us today. So. Uh, those are all downloadable documents. Also, Canada Health InfoWay has been very instrumental in helping with the adoption uh, and publication of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So that document that I just held up um, has two more columns off to the right, which are only your start date and your completion date. But it's over five pages orientated through a uh, the PMI, Project Management Institute um, project plan uh, of uh, planning, executing, quality control, and monitoring. And if you could look through it one time, beginning to end, there may be things that are discarded that don't apply to you, but at least you know at the end of the five pages, you have given everything one consideration. Maybe you want to talk with somebody else about a certain part of it. But I find that the more you talk about this project before you actually start it, particularly with different departments in your company, you will get feedback which helps shape the plan for execution. So, um, okay. So here's the basics. I just want you to remember three things. You're gonna create a source file. You're going to map to LOINC, and then your output is going to be replicated. And this is going to be kind of a lather, rinse, and repeat type setting. So no matter what subject domain that you are going to be working with, you have to start with some sort of a file uh, or a scope of work that this is going to be. So if you're from a laboratory, you know, maybe you're just going to do the chemistry bench. If you're from an IVD manufacturer, maybe you have a particular line of products that is going to be the subject. Once you have the, the binoculars dialed in on what your source file is going to be, you can start creating that. And that's your first step. Then comes the uh, application of the, uh, the learning that you're doing this week uh, and in your independent study to mapping those particular terms from your local codes to a, a LOINC code. And then I always like to keep the uh, acknowledgement that when you're done, you're not really ever done. I'm sorry. Uh, this is a maintenance is a continual cycle. There will be new releases come out from LOINC. Um, you will have changes to either your product line or to your laboratory, which will require some sort of maintenance tuning. And at the end of your mapping uh, exercise, you will actually be turning over the file to somebody in maybe your IT department to upload to some tables. 
uh, in your LIS. Or if you're an IVD manufacturer, perhaps you're going to disseminate this to your compliance officer or to marketing for distribution. This was one of the questions that Chris had during um, Jamie's conversation is why can't we have some public publicly available uh, livid sheets from the manufacturers? And in honesty, um, if you start asking, you'll find that there are some. The constraint that we have right now is in the industry hasn't quite decided, will these be individual by manufacturer or will there be a federated distribution site? That just hasn't come about yet. So always ask before you start your project, you might not have to um, do as much link mapping as you think you might. Um, stay here for just a second, oh, James. Sorry. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Um, when you're mapping Deloitte, this was another question that was in the, in the chat box uh, earlier. Um, I always encourage people to look at not only the active statuses uh, of LOINC, but also for the trial statuses and the discouraged statuses. This is a very fluid database, and there could be some perceptions of why something is discouraged from Reagan Street that don't apply to the industry. So we always, for our clients, will confirm with them, you know, this is a discouraged code, here's the reason it is. Oh, one example is um, the panel, urine micros mic microscopy. So it is a, a discouraged status because Reagan Streep was trying to help if you have a drop down menu that the, that the clinician can't just order microscopic urine right away. Perhaps the lab has a protocol where they have to do a dipstick first. And if the dipstick is positive by certain parameters, then a uh, microscopic panel is, is reflexed on. So that discouraged state is only just to be like a, hey, think about this, but it's not meant to not ever be used. It's just for that protocol. Um, another example is the cryoglobulin. There's a cryoglobulin serum or plasma. And if you go and look at the, uh, that is discouraged. And if you go and look at the reasoning, um, it's, found, it's noted that serum and plasma are not interchangeable specimens for cryoglobulin because serum can only detect cryoglobulin, but plasma can detect both cryoglobulin and cryofibrinogen. So there's a nuance there that just needs to be checked with. So in that instance, we don't ever issue the LOINC code for the serum plasma um, cryoglobulin. We will confirm with site, what is it that's being measured at your site? What is truly your specimen? And then give them the appropriate serum only or plasma only. I also encourage you, whenever you find something that seems just a little awry, maybe post it in the forum, something that's trial or something that's deprecated, and start a conversation because the healthcare industry is changing a lot. Technology changes, and um, some reasons for being in a trial status could be elevated to now be fully active. Mm -hmm. um, sometime, and I think I've even had a conversation or two where uh, Reagan Street deprecated something but yet some of our clients were still using the code. So we went and gave them the evidence that it's not, it, this may be an old technique, but it's still being used in the industry. So please still keep that as an active status. Okay, Jamie, next slide. So I've divided a couple of grids up into pre-analytical, analytical, and post-analytical. And then we have two columns, depending on if you're coming from a hospital or laboratory basis, versus you're coming from um, IVD manufacturer. Again, I had mentioned if you go and talk of this up, this project up before you even start and you talk to different departments that may be interested in having this information, you'll be able to get feedback from them on what their expectations are, um, what information or, or the size of the scope even, maybe you have a smaller scope, but compliance and marketing want to go to a larger scope. It helps the organization do the work once um, and have the best foot forward in having a completion uh, metric the first time around. So public health, uh, reporting, information systems, epidemiology, quality, those departments may all be interested in knowing that LOINC is going to be adopted by the LIS system. Um, determining your scope, I mean, kind of just goes without saying, you know, how big do you want your project to be? Do you want to do a pilot first with just maybe one department um, or just start with one specific product line. Now, 
I did list on the third row user preference for determining your mapping format. Are you going to store it in Relma or are you going to choose from search.link.org and put it in your own file? And I've heard several times now that they're going to have a new browser online, which is really exciting. But the one thing I love about Relma is that it creates a mapping output file for you, which means that you have less cutting and pasting on your individual decisions. So there's a time um, variable in there that's pretty important if you're doing your full lab catalog and you're doing, you know, 8,000 rows of, of uh, results, um, cutting and pasting 8,000 rows is not very appetizing to me. I don't imagine it is to you as well. So I'll be, you know, that's one thing I'll be watching for at the demo this afternoon. Okay, Jamie, let's get into the analytical. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you too that the, the source file is going to look entirely different. So the hospital laboratory is going to have an extra, oh, go ahead and go back one. The, they're going to have their LIS extraction. The um, IVD manufacturer doesn't have an LIS to begin with. And I'm unaware of the computer systems that they have regarding um, their development uh, or their publications. However, I do know that we have uh, package inserts that we can work from. So I'll skip forward just a little bit here. So I, I I gave you a the second line is just kind of a rule of thumb measurement over my years of experience of how much work you may have to do uh, between being a hospital or doing uh, being an IVD. And the audit on this last comment, I'll just make um, the comment that have the original mapper audit first because after they finish their uh, exercise, they are now the um, they're the subject matter content. They're the experts now. They've lived through this. And if there had been any errors in cutting or pasting, um, or you were one line off in your choosing of different things, it will become very apparent um, if you just will do a sanity check. Just look at your output file, however it was created, and just read it with fresh eyes and see if there was anything that didn't seem right. You know, maybe you have units of measure, which should give you a quantitative scale but you chose an ordinal or a nominal term. So you can do some filters in Excel looking for populated units of measure with a ordinal or, or nominal um, scale uh, on the filter, on the column. Go ahead, Jamie. All right. So if you'll remember from Jamie's uh, tutorial, the six axes are component, property, timing, system, scale, and method. Do you know that in an LIS, there are no data elements with those same headers? So it's kind of a hint that it's best if you can pull forward some information about ordering, an order mnemonic and an order display. The specimen is usually tied to that in the LIS. So you can get your specimen type from that pull and interweave it with a listing of all your results uh, codes, which can be orderable by themselves, like sodium, potassium, glucose, or non-orderable by themselves, like mean cell volume. Um, and then bring along that display, units and measure. If you can have a result type and a methodology, great. So an, an export from an LIS looks one way. The IVD manufacturers, remember, they don't have an LIS. So that's going to be more of just the LIVID format. And David had shown the CDC FDA livid uh, file, I just took a small snippet of a part of that that might have some identifiers for the manufacturer to go by and then made a header for each of the six axes. I wouldn't try to fill them out all by myself. I might definitely get in, I will definitely get in component and I will definitely get in system, but I might wait a bit and, and uh, before I fill in the others to start looking. Next slide. Package inserts are super, super, super helpful. Um, I think out of my favorite sections to go, the intended use, I can usually get five, five axes out of that. Um, and the summary and explanation of tests. I will go down into results to get to confirm about the um, units of measure to really get in on that. Um, but usually intended use and summary and explanation of the tests are the, the best. That's the gold mine. Next slide. So 
So let's say that the mapping uh, project has gone through one pass. We propose that you do some peer review. Now, the great thing about having a second person look over your shoulder at your work is that now you have someone for vacation coverage. Uh, now we have someone else who can share the load um, and it gains internal confidence in the mappings that you've chosen. We had already mentioned by the, our three finger, the basics, that the, the third finger was the creation of outputs. So there's gonna be a file for the IT department to receive from an LIS so that the LIS can be updated. Otherwise, for an IVD manufacturer, there's gonna be a file to be disseminated publicly so that Chris has lighter work and he can, get, um, he can get all of his link mappings in. Remember that link comes out twice a year. So there can be impacts uh, on your mappings from LOINC itself. Realma has an option um, to do a search to see if anything's been newly deprecated, but also have a checklist internally. If your LIS makes any changes to name, specimen, result format, units of measure, or you bring in any new instruments, or you bring in new assays, or you bring in replacement assays, those should all be at the tip of your finger as the database administrator that link needs to be looked at again for that assay. Next slide. So once again, it's a lather, lather rinse and repeat. If you are doing your, um, uh, your second reiteration, so you've, you implemented link last year and now you have a change file, it still starts with a source file of your changes mapping to LOINC and then updating. So I'm being told by Jennifer, we need to leave time for questions. One more slide, I think. Is there Jamie, one more slide? Yep, I know it's gonna be a busy week. Uh, so just take a note, just take a, a moment and jot down, where is your project right now? Are you in planning and pre-analytical? Are you in the middle of it and you're in analytical and you're in full swing, just grooving along? This conference is just coincidental. Or are you stalled and you're looking for some help? Reach out to the community. Um, at, or are you in your maintenance plan and you just need your confidence level boosted or perhaps you're all set to go. But anyway, I'll open the floor for questions. So I'm not sure, do we have any questions online? We don't have any open questions online at the moment. Pam and I kind of breezed through those pretty quickly. So, <laughs> and all of this will definitely be available after the conference as well, um, both the slides and the recording. Yeah, the recording will be available uh, slightly later next week. Um, we just want to make sure we edit any. Um, you know, things that uh, in the beginning or the end. So yeah. uh, the slides will be available probably by the end of the week. And then also the recording uh, will be available on the website, uh, conference website, probably late next week. I'd like to ask a question of the audience, if we have a moment. Sure, go. Cool. Uh, for five those minutes. of you from the IVD manufacturing community, how many of you um, already have Livid going or available for the public? You guys can raise your hand if you'd like. I don't see any hands being raised, Pam. I would, I know that Roche has done it. I know that oh, Biomir has done it. Yep, we got one. I think that Abbott has part of it. They may have more of it. Um, Siemens has it. Um, oh. Beckman Coulter has also told me that they have it. Now, whether they have their link mappings done and they have it in Livid or, or not, that, that's two different things. Um, mm -hmm. But we are looking for the, um, I, the nonprofit IVDConnectivity.org um, is where you can go to get the, uh, the framework for a Livid format um, and the law specifications, which will help jumpstart an IVD manufacturer. We do have one last question, it looks like. Somebody has asked, what does LIVID, Livid. stand for? <laughs> yeah, LIVID, oh. LIVID stands, there's, so when we first made it, I heard it was LOINC in vitro diagnostics. 
And then I heard it was going to be lab in vitro diagnostics. So I'm still thinking of it as, as livid, as LOINC, in vitro diagnostics. And it's yeah, I think the current is LOINC. Yeah. And I'll put in the chat box that um, IVD connectivity website that you can go out. If you are an IVD manufacturer, you can go out and get the um, law and livid specifications. There are downloadable uh, documents, uh, educational documents, as well as the format of the spreadsheet itself. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens like by 2025, maybe there's no more lap, uh, link mapping to be done except by the IVD manufacturers and everyone just imports it in from some federal database. I'll put it out there. So we, we do have, have a comment here. It says I'm with Fujifilm ultrasound systems and we've incorporated both Loink and SNOMED mappings with structured reporting. It's becoming more used. However, the mapping of the values can be difficult if you don't have a subject matter expert. So vendors normally give people the ability to map terminology as opposed to providing it. So they provide the ability to do it, but not necessarily the direct connection is my understanding. Great, we have one more question it looks like, and then we've got a, uh, about two minutes. <laughs> And they would like to know, can you explain a bit about post-coordination? Oh, post-coordination? Mm -hmm. um, I guess in, that's in the sense of how much is contained within a single link code versus using multiple standardized codes or ways of uh, representing the same data. So the link code may be more generic, which we would consider uh, maybe a post-coordinated approach where either the method or the system or some other information needs to be sent elsewhere, um, either using another link code or there might be a slot within the HL7 message uh, where that information can be sent, like in the SPM segment. Um, or there's people, there's labs who choose to use the link code because of their use case um, that does contain the specimen information, the exact specimen for each test. And it kind of depends on how an LIS system is built and then how they share the data with other LIS systems. So it, it really depends on the use case. And then maybe, you know, eventually I think regulations will determine um, how specific a link code should be, how pre-coordinated, you know, whether it should fully specify the system, the method, you know, all that information or whether there's a more post-coordinated approach where um, and I guess that all depends on what's considered pre-coordinated versus post-coordinated as well, so. I would just recommend that you all get accounts at link.org and let's keep these conversations going in the user forum. We'd love to talk about it all year long. Thanks. <laughs>